And welcome back to Dollars and Dragons. Today we have with us Anya Combs. If you'd like to introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Hi, I'm Anya Combs. Um, I have been in the games industry 15 years. It's been a very long time. I've worn a lot of hats <laughs> in this space. Uh, I've never designed or made a game as a person who's been in the industry as long as I have. But I've been a part of a lot of the world of game making, which is really cool. Uh, I live in New York. Uh, I've been in New York. Actually, it's my 10-year anniversary of being in New York. So so the the trick with New York is if you've been there for 10 years, then you're an official New Yorker. Although you okay. can never say that to like anyone who's actually from New York. It's like very controversial, but like whatever. <laughs> um, Do you get and, a ribbon? Do you get a badge? No, you just get, I don't know, that's a... a it's punch in the face from someone on the street. Special, I don't know. A special swear word you can use now. Yeah. <laughs> you start pronouncing words differently or something. I don't know. <laughs> you get street cred is what you get. You get like hardcore yeah. street cred. Um, and when I'm not doing game stuff, I am a freelance musician here in New York City. Wonderful. And before we talk about games, let's talk about the Funk Rust Brass Band, where you started <laughs> and where you're at currently with that. Yes. So I joined the Funk Rust Brass Band in 2015, very shortly after they formed. Um, Funk Rust Brass Band is New York's one and only post-apocalyptic disco punk brass band. Um, it was started by this guy, Phil Andrews, and his now wife, Elia Bisker. Um, Phil writes all of the music. Elia writes all of the lyrics. They, they co-write together. Um, so the concept of the band was we take a little bit of the New Orleans sort of brass band scene. We do a lot of the EDM style of music, right? So just the, the fundamental style of music. And all of those things are sort of molded together into this brass band that does a lot of EDM influenced brass band music. Um, all of our songs are original. We do no covers. Uh, we wear costumes. We wear makeup. There's choreography involved. There's anywhere between eight to 25 of us. It really just sort of depends on the gig and sort of like what's been required. Um, it's been a really amazing creative outlet. It's also just been like a really incredible community for me to be a part of. Um, I play the saxophone. I guess I forgot to mention that. So I play alto in that band. Um, it, I, I, I would not be here. I would not be the musician that I am without not just that band, but the people in that band, it's an incredibly supportive community. It's its not really run like an anarchist collective, but it definitely has a lot of anarchist collective influences. So there is somebody who is the leader of the band, but everything is discussed out in the open. There's a lot of like democratic socialist values. Um, part of that is because Phil, who's the leader, is a community organizer by trade. So he takes a lot of the tenants that go into community organizing and puts them into the band. Um, we just finished recording our third record. I think we're going to be doing a Kickstarter in the summer for it, which is really exciting. Um, and we have a couple gigs coming up. So if you're in New York, come check out this super weird band that has a singer that sings through a megaphone and we'll get you to dance. That's, that's, uh, amazing. Um, what are some of the gigs that you have done since you've joined the band and what's uh, some of your memorable gigs that you've played? Oh boy. I have played, this is the coolest part about being a musician in New York. It is it. And, and specifically like a musician in this space of like the weird sort of like out there artsy punk world. It brings you into spaces that like you would never play. Right. So like my life before Funk Rust, I was a like I studied classical music. That was the thing that I studied. I studied classical saxophone. And I was I was a really good classical saxophonist, right? But like nobody wants that. <laughs> nobody is like, you know what I really need? Classical saxophone. Uh, <laughs> so I I like prior to Funk Rest, like I played Carnegie Hall. It was great. I did a lot of these like really highbrow classical things and then would get plastered with my friends after and like listen to punk music. Um so then being able to take you know, my saxophone that I'm so hardcore studied in classical and be able to play a bunch of weird punk music, um, punk EDM music. It's brought me to some of the most interesting places in New York City. Um, we were we had a small residency at the Brooklyn. I'm sorry, at the Bronx, uh, the Bronx Botanical Gardens, which was 
amazing. It was during the Truly exhibit. And so we just got to play like, you know, in this beautiful botanical garden. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Absolutely wonderful. Um, we've done birthday parties. Uh, I think we're doing a couple weddings this year, which I was like, the fact that you want to hire this band to play your wedding means this wedding is going to be lit. Um, <laughs> we have played this party space called Rubelod. I mean, so many times we're good friends with the owners. It's an underground party space that's been part of New York City for, I mean, years upon years upon years. Um, the, I would say the two most memorable gigs. Oh, we've also done we got we flew ourselves out to Seattle and played in Seattle last year, which was like, oh, really? really? Cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We, there's this cool festival in June called Honk, which is um, it's all brass bands, all like street brass bands. So we're part of the like street brass band world where you just go out in the streets and play in the streets and like, you know, it's like a wild thing. Um, my one of my other bands is going again this year. I'm not gonna be able to go because I have another gig, but like it's a cool free event. If you're in Seattle, I would like highly re recommend checking it out. Some of my game dev friends came to the last time I played there, which was really sweet. So they were like, we get to see you do your like music thing. This is so cool. I was like, yeah, it's chill. Um, but I would say the two most memorable gigs that we've played as a band. One is a place called Sea Squat in the Lower East Side. Um, it's the oldest squat in new york city meaning that it's not owned by the city that it's owned by the people who like live there right and it's a squat so you basically like you don't really pay any rent to live there you have to just kind of like earn your keep sort of vibe it is as decrepit and run down it's full of graffiti it smells terrible the toilet's like absolutely not it's just like sewage everywhere uh, but it was like a punk institution. And so it was just really cool to be able to like play that. Um, we also were, uh, we were really hired just to be more of a spectacle than like a band. And it was like a little bit confusing, but once I understood what the gig was, I was like, okay, cool. Got it. Um, we did this really cool, like pretty famous play in New York city called sleep no more, which is, um, an interactive experience. It started in London. So it's really big in London. I there's, they've got to be all over the U S all over the world, but they're interactive theater experiences. So it's, um, basically retelling of, um, I think it's Hamlet. Um, and so it's like six floors. It's supposed to be like purgatory. So six layers of hell. And each you as the viewer, you wear a mask. It's this like creepy mask. Um, uh, it's actually one of the, um, the, the plague masks. So when the quarantine was happening, I was like, oh, my God, all, everyone who has to sleep no more mask because you get to take the mask home was like, y'all are set for life. Um, so you can go anywhere as the play is going on and then everything culminates at the bottom during this like big sort of scene that everybody's sort of acting in but you can interact with the the um the actors and the actresses and they might take you into like a room for a private performance it's like very it's like a big deal um but we did their halloween parties and so we were the band that was hired to sort of like get everybody hyped because they would have the show and each floor they were flipping to then be uh to have like a halloween theme and so we were entertaining people on like floor one while floor two was getting ready as soon as floor two was getting ready we would like hide piper everybody up to the second floor come back downstairs, pied people, piper people up to the third floor. And that was our job for a couple of years, which was like just such a weird, unique experience to be a part of. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Um, it's uh, Macbeth, it looks like, right? Oh, Macbeth. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. One of those other Shakespearean plays. And, yeah. You know, um, but yeah, this looks this looks super cool. Uh, I really like live performance and like especially mm -hmm. for dates and things like that and just there's something unique about just feeling the energy of like the performance mm -hmm. whether it be some sort of theater production or a live show or something like that what's uh when did you what how old were you when you started playing um i was 11 okay so you started really grade, early man. yeah sixth okay. grade band. i mean i started saxophone when i was 11 but like my mom says that i was singing before i was talking or like humming at least just like uh. music music's been massive part of my life my entire life my mom was a musician her family everybody in her family was a musician my grandfather was a composer um like he he was a music teacher he was a composer it, it it's just kind of in my blood um 
And I started on piano, but I refused to learn how to read music because I was too stubborn. So Mm -hmm. there was something that clicked to me as like a very young child where I was like, oh, because we had a piano in the house growing up, right? Like not super uncommon. And there was something that clicked in my head where I was like, wait, all of the sounds that I hear on this little radio, they can be played on this instrument. That is really cool. And I would just spend hours just trying to figure stuff out because I thought it was so cool and so interesting and my all my uncles tried to teach me how to read music and I was like nope I'm not going to do it and then I had to when I started playing the saxophone right right yeah because it's all it's all pretty much sheet music there and there's not very many like there's not many like pickup bands for saxophonists that I would imagine um well it's it's more it's just called it's called sitting in so if you're like I just need to sit in and listen like that's one of the things that I have been really thankful. I think it. I like got away from that for so long in classical music school where it was like, you play what's on the page, play what's on the page. And it got really drilled into us. Like you just play what's on the page. And so the like, and it was fun, like, don't get me wrong, but the, 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 like the fun and the artistry of it really kind of like fell away from me for a really long time. And so I stopped playing after I left college. Cause I was like, I only know how to play what's on a page, even though most of from like 11 to 18, I just would play stuff by ear, even though I could read music, but I was like, I love playing stuff by ear. That all went away. And I've had to sort of relearn how to do that over the last couple of years. And I'm really thankful that I had that time between eight ages 11 to 18, because I, it's like riding a bike, right? Like that's such a trite thing to say, but it's true. Um, I, I'm much better at just listening. You could play something for me like two or three times and I'm like, great, got it, no problem. Like I could just play yeah. it. And it, it's not like a, I don't have perfect pitch. I, right. it's not, I'm not like a prodigy. I'm not an aficionado. I'm, none of that. It's just practice diligence. And like, I just know, <laughs> like I can't, yeah. like it's the only way to explain it. So like this yeah. past gig that I did on Saturday, so much of it was like, the three horns i was playing with two people that have been playing together for 30 years i can't pick up on that energy i can't pick up on that like band synergy right like that is a relationship that i am coming into and trying to facilitate and participate not facilitate sorry trying to like participate in Mm -hmm. and so it was a lot of like they just knew each other's tendencies i didn't and so they also had uh they had sheet music that one of them had sort of like brought to the gig but they're in concert B flat and I'm in concert E flat. And so I was like, this does nothing for me, quite frankly. So I was just like, listen, and they would play it once or twice. And I was like, got it. I'm just going to follow along, listen and play, figure it out. That's uh, that's really cool. That seems like two different worlds in music. Like there's, uh, if we want to relate that to acting, I suppose it's like improv and then, yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Everybody knows Shakespeare, right? Like you can't deviate from Shakespeare. You can't, you can't deviate from, you know, death of a salesman. You can't deviate from wicked, right? There's a couple little things that you could throw in there as little, you know, fun, little cute things. But like people go to see those plays because they know every word in improv. It's like, here's, you know, here's a, here's a word, here's a phrase. And it's not it's not really that everything is made up. It's that everything's made up. You know the tendencies of what everyone is going to do. And it's all based on games that you've been playing. So all those games that you've been playing then come into play during that session of of improv. It's the same thing. Practice my scales every day. Practice my arpeggios every day. Do the practice so that when it's time to just sort of like start playing to play, you know, work on the licks that I've been working on. Uh, you do all of that ahead of time. So then when it's time, you just bring it there. Yeah, for sure. How long um how, how long do you spend each week practicing, would you say, when you've got gigs coming up? I try to spend 2 to 3 hours a day practicing no matter what. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's a matter of what I practice. That's that's right. sort of what. So like today I did I did my long term, I did my long version of fundamentals, so I've like a couple different versions of fundamentals that I do. And I did my long fundamentals and I have a recording session on Thursday. And so I was working out some ideas for that recording session on Thursday. Tomorrow I'll do the same thing. Thursday I'll do the same thing. Friday I'll probably work on funk rest stuff because we have funk rest rehearsal on Sunday. And then Sunday I'm going to start for I have a couple of weddings in April and I have another recording session in June. So I've got to start looking at that recording stuff for June. Gotcha. I have this funny image in my head right now. And that's why I was smiling um, of you just like, practicing in between zoom meetings and then like if someone answers the call you just like sling your saxophone 
<laughs> I don't like, sling it, but I have my background <laughs> on uh, on Google Meet. I have it like blurred out, so my horn is usually just sort of here. And then I'll okay. like depending on if I wear my harness or my neck strap, I'll just take them off. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm Anya. You're you're <laughs> funk master for this, this Zoom meeting. <laughs> That's uh, really funny. All right. Um, let's uh, let's pivot to games. Um, yeah. You have a, a long and storied history in music. Let's talk about your other life, your alter ego, professional <laughs> life. Well, how did you get started in games? Uh, I believe addicting games was your first gig. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I actually fell into it. So I don't have a deep history in games in terms of playing games as like a child. Um, Part of that's because I found music so early and that was just like, that's what I did is I just played all the time. That's all I wanted to do is just play music. Like my weekends were playing my saxophone, practicing my saxophone, or like I had, I was in a ska band. I did honor bands. I did everything I could to just like do music. Um, But I also grew up uh, in the early to late nineties where it was a little bit of a, I hate to, I hate to like do the old person thing of like, it was a different time, but like, it's totally true. <laughs> right. Like I yeah. remember wanting to play magic. I remember wanting to learn magic. And I was told by everybody that I knew, like girls don't do that. And so I internalized a lot of that, like ridiculous misogyny. And I was like, oh, I'm not allowed to do this because I'm a girl. Um, my parents also were like very hardcore about like no video games. What do I end up doing? <laughs> yeah, rebelling the hardest way you can. <laughs> oh yeah, they also said no cartoons, and I was like, haha, jokes on you, Nickelodeon and games is what pays my bills. Like, cool, thanks, SpongeBob and the Chief, <laughs> um, or Master Chief. Uh, so yeah, I played like I played board games, right? Like I played like Balderdash and I played Boggle and I we had a lot of like family game nights, but like right. that was really kind of it. I didn't really I didn't play D and D. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about role playing games. I knew nothing, right? Because I was told like, no, you're not allowed to. And I remember like thinking like, oh, I'd love to like do a LARP. I think that would be so cool. And people are like, uh, nerds do that, and like, no, <laughs> that's like not cool. And now it's like super cool, right? Um, I played like. I, it's funny because I did play flash games. I played like, um, oh, I played a lot of Bejeweled. I, I just played a lot of like f- fun little flash games that were like really popular at the time. Yeah. Um, and but I, I had, I actually never graduated college. I just kind of left. <laughs> I'm like a science class short of getting my music degree, and I was like, whatever, school, like go to college. <laughs> like I, I'm not against college, but also like you don't really have to. Not nowadays, no. Yeah, like find a trade, get a, it's fine, whatever. Do it if you have the money, if you have the money and you're, or if you're willing to just pay a stupid amount of debt. Like the the relationships that you build in college, I think are quite frankly, sometimes more beneficial than the actual college itself. I also right. think that college is really only like good if you know what you want to do. If you're going to college and you're just like trying to figure it out, like <laughs> I think that's just a waste of money. It's different for everybody, but I... I left college and was like, oh, my God, I have all this student debt and I have to get a job and music, 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 music. I got a job in music. I hated it. I hated how I was being treated. I hated I just hated it. Um, I think part of that was like I hadn't come to terms with the fact that like I wanted to play music. I didn't necessarily want to work in music, but also I worked for a horrible boss who was just like he just was a bad person. Um, And I found this job listing for, quote, developer relations associate, and they described it as doing A&R artist and repertoire for for games. And I was like, well, artist and repertoire is what I wanted to do. That's what I went to school for was to help develop artists and build artists to like, you know, make them the best possible versions of themselves. Although that job has changed significantly in the music industry now. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was for at that time MTV Networks. Um, and that eventually was Nickelodeon. It's a whole complicated, weird corporate story where somebody made a decision. Yeah. Um, so I got, so I just, I got this job looking at flash games all day and, and licensing flash games. And they wanted someone who didn't have like a deep history in games because the target audience was like eight year olds and eight year olds aren't going to be like, that's Katamari. Right. So at 25, I was like, this seems cool. I'll do this for a year. Yeah. So I got the job and I was like. I'll just do this for like, I don't know, a year or two. And I just had this quick realization where I, and like, 
I would email with these people and they were just like so excited. They're like, oh my gosh, thank you for emailing me back. And I was like, I'm literally just doing my job. Like what? Um, yeah. But I had this realization that like game developers are the exact same as any other artist that's out there. And it doesn't matter like at what level or or where you are in game development. If you're making a game in any capacity, you're an artist, right? So it was this just like quick realization of like, we are not treating game developers as artists, we're treating them as like engineers. And that's not really what this is. I understand that there's tech involved, but that's not really what this is. And I'm not even saying like, you know, I, I actually don't subscribe to the like big tech view of like these people that are disrupting the industry. Like it's not art, kind of just being a dick. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there is some art in some spaces like that. But it, it's not the same as someone making a like political controversial game. It's different. Mm -hmm. um, so I've I've I, I've tried and I hope and I, you know, my 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 whole sort of like mission statement as Anya Combs games professional is that people who make games are artists and should be treated as artists. And I would like to see more of that in the industry. I do think it's changing a lot. But that was the realization to me of like, this is the same thing as working with musicians. It's the same exact thing. It's just a different medium, right? But like the creative anxieties, the roadblocks, the conflict, the communication, all of it is exactly the same. It's no different than a band making a record. It's just an output. That's all it is. That's really so, fascinating that you came into it from uh, that perspective. And I think um, there's a lot of value for different industries and uh for you to have a different set of li both life experience and perspective and coming into a new industry instead of starting in in an industry and staying in the same industry your entire life i think that really makes you a lot more versatile and it allows you to i think in a lot of ways be a better team player because you have a very different perspective so you're willing to come in most of the time at least um unless you're that guy, quote unquote, um, <laughs> where you come in with like preconceived notions from a different industry. But, um, you know, most people who come in from uh, a different role, they normally are a lot more receptive to uh, what is the truth of it and what is being done here because it's the way that we've been doing it the entire time and what yeah. is actually the good way to do this. Yeah, I I think one of the easiest things for like young game developers and, and young designers to fall into is to only surround yourself with other developers and designers. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But the challenge is you're only going to get one perspective. It could be that people look at a problem from different viewpoints, but it's still one perspective, right? Like, I, I struggle with this a lot just sort of in my personal life of like, it's it's really hard to have two effectively two full-time jobs. It's really hard. I am busy and stressed all the time. And I don't necessarily manage my stress like in the best way possible. And I get really like I get testy. I get down on myself. I take it out in ways that is not healthy. I, I think about like, do I just quit music and do games full time? That's not going to make me happy. Do I quit games and do music full time? That's not going to make me happy. It's just not like I need to have the two spaces in order to exist because I think that they are complementary like mediums that give me a different perspective and help me look at things from different viewpoints. I think that to go back to like falling into the pitfall of like young designers, like I totally understand why you only want to surround yourself with like like minded people because you've you found your community and it's so awesome and it's so exciting. I will always encourage young designers and young anybody that's getting into games, make sure that you have a friend group that's outside of what your like core uh, world is, right? Like everybody plays games. It's important to like also make sure that you're talking to people from different worlds. It's the same thing where it's like you need you you should have a diverse set of friends. Like it's super necessary, but it also helps keep you grounded. And it's also like, you know, Game designers, for the most part, can only look at something from the perspective of game designer hat. So go talk to somebody who's not a game designer and be like, here's a problem. What do you think of this? Yeah, definitely. I um, I think I, for a long time, especially in the military, everybody's so specialized generally um, within their particular job that when they had a habit in the uh, military to like uh, take you out of your primary job and then move you to like a secondary duty assignment. So for me, that was recruiting. 
And that was a very illuminating experience, I think, because I was like taken from my primary job where I felt pretty comfortable at the time. Um, I was running a machine gun squad. And then I was like on the streets uh, talking to kids. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, it was it was wild. But um, it was one of those things where it was like I had to learn very quickly. And then obviously it's very different dealing with like teachers and principals and parents as it is dealing and kids um, and figuring out like, how do I communicate with these kids and get them to understand and uh, sort of communicate with me in a way that's useful and then for them and for me. Um, so it was, it was definitely, uh, it, it had its, some unique challenges to it, but there's a lot of people in that situation that don't do as well because they're not able to sort of adjust their perspective or the way that they're used to doing things. I get that. I think it's really hard when you're used to doing something a very specific way and you're used to, this is so dark, but I also think like sometimes it's just easier to anticipate disappointment. Yeah. Well, same old story, right? Because if something were to change and be different, there's a lot of implications and there's a lot of like there's a ripple effect sometimes when that happens. Right. Not just in, in like professional, but like in personal relationships, too. Right. Like, well, I'm just going to be disappointed. So why should I even try something different? Right. Like this right. Is just same old, same old. So it I, I can I, I fully understand why it's easy to slip into that. I think that's also why people like uh, company hop so much. You yeah. know, you'll see in people's resumes, like, oh, I was a year here, a year here, a year here, a year here. And like, you can interpret that in a handful of different ways. But I can also see that being like, you know, one world of that is like, I was just trying to get away from the same shit that's at every corporate company. Demoralizing at times. Um, the problem is not with uh, any individual. It's like with just the system itself, like these systems. The really, yeah, the structure of corporations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... I had something so profound to say, but then I lost it. Oh, so no. Imagine that I did say something really profound there. Um, <laughs> but Friday, for... that was so profound. Oh, thank you so much, Tanya. <laughs> it means a lot coming from you. Hell um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, for, for sure. Uh, oh, yeah, what I was going to say. Um, so people, I think, for the most part, when they go into a new position, they just need to adjust their expectations and make them realistic. So most people, I think, crave progress more than like accomplishments. So... And especially creatives, right? So most people who are creating something don't necessarily want it to be best game ever for their first game. They want to make a game and then have someone like certain aspects of it and then get some critique on the rest of it that is going to improve them. Because everyone, except for like a very small percentage of people, is going to understand when they come into it, they're not going to be very good. So I think that's also part of the struggle for new creatives is where do I find people I can trust and um, know that they're going to give me actual feedback that's going to be helpful for me? Because there's this, there's like a lot of information. There's a ton of bad advice. Professional GM who gives professional GM advice to everyone. I hear this line every week just about, hey, so Friday, can you help me with this problem? Because like I was getting some really bad advice and basically wasted three months of my time. And I'm just like, you could have came to me first, big dog like <laughs> but you had to you had to fuck around and find out from some random person in a discord <laughs> couldn't go with me that's fine but uh, um yeah but there's a there's a lot of people out there who are more interested in and this is we're sort of going off on a tangent but this is something that i have uh, I think personal stake in like just being very personally upset about because can you hear my children yell in the background? Mm -hmm. They're fine. Their mother has them. <laughs> no one's being killed. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think um, most people are or some some small subset of very loud people in, in any industry are more interested in hearing themselves talk and feeling like they have an impact than actually making an impact. And I think that's, yeah. that's true in many different fields that I've seen. Like people that are very eager to tell people why their stuff isn't good enough, why um, they think that they should do this instead because it relates to their singular perspective and the thing that they did that in gave them some modicum of success instead mm -hmm. of taking a look at where that person is at and what is best going to serve that person individually and giving good advice, you know? Yeah, uh, I think that... I'm going to be very careful about how I say this. Um, we can edit it out if you aren't. <laughs> Just let me know. <laughs> yeah. I think that creative spaces breeds 
uh, not not fame necessarily, but like popularity. And I think unfortunately that can bring out some narcissistic behaviors, right? Because I think that the word narcissist is very overused and very overdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not a mental health professional, but that is a personal opinion. Uh, But I think that narcissistic tendencies and narcissistic behaviors can easily come to light, especially when popularity is thrust upon people overnight. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people think that they are the voice that wants to be heard when actually they are the ones that need to be the quietest in the room. And I think that can be really challenging. And I think sometimes the people who don't have the narcissistic tendencies with the popularity that they have kind of seen, they tend to be looked, they tend to be passed over because they're not willing to engage in some of those behaviors, right? Like the loudest person in the room is not necessarily the smartest. They're just the loudest. But it does mean that their voice is going to get heard the most. And I think in a lot of the discourse that we've been seeing in the tabletop, not just tabletop, quite frankly, but also video games, games in general, that is something that I get, especially 15 years into this, that that is one of those like, fu- not only fuck around and find out, but like, damn, y'all, we're just going to repeat this shit. We didn't learn. We didn't learn 10 years ago. We didn't learn 15 years ago. We're just going to have to keep doing this shit like what 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 if we didn't <laughs> right yeah. like the the discourse that's happening now of um the wizards um the creator summit, summit. yeah the creator, yeah, the creator summit i don't know man like I, I i understand i have to be a little bit careful with what i say here but like my personal opinion is like just just let people do their thing i don't yeah. this is not really hurting anybody right right and like let wizards do the, at the end of the day it's it's wizards as a company they're trying to rebrand they're trying to tarnish an image that they tarnish themselves and if it means that a bunch of people who have a love for a thing that they've loved for some of them their entire lives get to get together and celebrate that thing who is that actually hurting uh, that's what i don't understand yeah i think it i i was looking over it and um and I, I guess I have to be careful about what I say here. Hmm. Um, so what I will say is that um, so I already made like a Twitter thread basically calling myself a clout chaser, uh, a clout chaser, because I am. And that's like how, like, that's like part of my marketing strategy for uh, Twitter. That's how you grow on Twitter, to be quite honest. And if you think that's not how you grow on Twitter, then I would ask you how how much have you grown on Twitter and what has caused your growth in the last however long that you've been on Twitter. Because very seldom can you grow on a platform like Twitter without some sort of like method to engage people. And a lot of people use outrage marketing to good effect on platforms like Twitter um, and then sort of dilute their audience between uh, what they think that they want, which is um, they want people that are engaged in your platform. But if you build entirely with outrage marketing, that's entirely your audience. And you're sort of fulfilling this sort of prophecy for yourself where you're just surrounded with people who were initially interested in engaging with you for outreach marketing, when really maybe you want your platform to be this and that. So it's like a careful balance that a lot of people uh, try to sort of do, maybe intentionally or unintentionally. I know a lot of creators who have managed to grow to pretty sizable amounts um, through purely their work, bless their hearts. I don't have that long. (laughs) <laughs> I like most people who have like done it in a way that's non-controversial takes them three, five times as long. Um, and a lot of the time, like they're just you can do it quickly if you like provide a little bit like more like shit posts that go well. And like it just depends on how you use the amount of exposure that you get. Because I remember when I started whenever I talk money on Twitter, for instance, my shit goes up everywhere. My shit goes everywhere. Everyone knows how much I make in Twitter and tabletop because I put it out there and people are very interested in that. And that just is not something that has been very covered or it's like a controversial subject because everyone um, believed it was like taboo to not do it. But I think with platforms like crowdfunding, I mean, like I owe nobody nothing. So someone like me, I don't give a fuck if I like go out there and I'd be like, hey, X name publisher, you should pay more. Like, I don't know anything to that publisher. So I'm not in danger as a freelancer to tell someone like, hey, this is probably what you should do because it's the right thing. Whereas a lot of people, unfortunately, and going full circle back to the creator summit, a lot of people are 
I don't want to say afraid of, but they have to be highly professional when they provide feedback like that to any sort of company because like it really just takes that one asshole in corporate who's going to, you know, take that personally whatever you said and like blackball you or something. And that's a I think that's a genuine fear to have as like yeah. as someone who has a social presence and you're also a creator. Yeah, I struggle with Twitter a lot. I the only reason I have the followers that I do is because I worked at Kickstarter. And I know mm-hmm. that and I acknowledge that and I'm 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 I am thankful that it has given me and allowed me the opportunities that I have and I'm thankful that I still have those opportunities post Kickstarter, right? I left Kickstarter a year ago. It's been a year this week and I'm thankful that people still Congrats. Thanks. I think uh, <laughs> it's it's wild that people like still want to hear it. and it's wild that my Twitter is still growing. I was convinced with, I had I had to go through these just like really weird like this past year. I think it's kind of settled out, but I had to go through these like weird sort of like uh, identity check-ins, right? Uh, I talked about this uh, on another podcast recently, um, but I had a I had like a bit of an identity crisis, and one of the things that I have done just to set like healthier boundaries for myself moving forward is I don't associate myself with a company anymore. Um, I work for a company, but I am not. That is not my identity. Right. I've mm-hmm. worked in games 15 years. I've been at the company that I work for for a year, but I've been in games 15 years and everything that I have done leading up to me leaving Kickstarter, I need to be able to celebrate and like kind of give a little bit of like a, a shout out to myself for. Right. Mm-hmm. I also like I, I very much believed and part of this was just I mean, that's one of the reasons I left Kickstarter. Uh, There's a handful of reasons, but definitely sort of getting the reinforcement of we made you no you were a you were a chapter in my story right like you're just a chapter in my story but like my book's not fucking finished and i get to tell my story i get to i'm the one who gets to do that right like having the identity crisis of like you are anya from kickstarter and that is all you are ever going to be and that's the only reason anybody wants to talk to you that was fully in my brain of like yes that is the only reason anybody ever wants to talk to me some of it's true some of it is still true. Some people still hit me up and they're like, I, you know, nobody's like the only reason I want to talk to you is because of Kickstarter, but like I, I can figure it out. Right. Yeah. Um, and I've, I am still very much in the process of like who, where do I fit in games? Right. Because I'm, I'm not a designer, a developer. I'm not a publisher, but I have a weird wealth of knowledge and I'm, I, I like have a lot of contacts just because I've been doing I've been in this space for so long I'm like a cockroach in games like you just kind of can't get rid of me (laughs) um and like what is it that I want to do that's also been like a huge question right and in some ways it's everything and in some ways it's like very few things yeah Right. But the thing that has always been exciting to me and the thing that I always want to do is I want to work with creative people and I want to see how I can help them. Right. Mm -hmm. Crowdfunding is the easiest thing for me to help with. I I know crowdfunding like the back of my hand. Right. Like I know the Kickstarter platform. I don't know all the platforms that are out there, but I know the Kickstarter platform. And if people need help like running their Kickstarters, like I I'm down. I'm I, I charge a very like you know, we'll talk about fees. It's totally cool. Whatever. Like, I don't want to just put people out. I also want to know that like a very reasonable fee. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I want to like my drive here is actually not I like it's so it's it sounds so like hippy dippy, but it's true. Like my drive isn't money. My drive is like, am I able to help you? And if I'm not able to help you, I don't want to get paid. And if I'm not able to help, if I'm not able to help you, that means I did a bad job and that sucks for everybody. So like that's that's a shitty experience. Right. But I'm going to do everything I can to help as as the best that I can. But separating myself as Anya, the individual versus Anya, the 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 company attached to my name and my name attached to the company was like truly one of the healthy healthiest things I've ever done for myself. I've talked to people. I've talked to friends of mine who've been in same situations and they've been like, yeah, separating myself from the company and being like, you know, X, Y, Z person who does this job who just happens to work for this company it doesn't get discussed and i wish it got discussed a lot more because it's 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 a horrible feeling when you have to leave because you're not happy and be like what the hell am i gonna do now no i totally i totally get it i left the marine corps after 13 years my entire identity was wrapped up in it yeah Yeah. i joined when i was 19 20 um yeah i 
And part of that also was like shedding my uh, sort of masculine role and like identity. So it was like super complicated for me. But I remember like even being like just I had a few months where I was just preparing to get out and um, I had already sent my family back west and I was just like laying in on my bed in the barracks and I was just like like staring at the ceiling and I just like cried for like four hours because I was so afraid of uh what was out there and like what what i was gonna do and everything like that and it wasn't that the marine corps like put me out with no notice and i was like helpless um it was just i had spent 13 years in the marine corps and that's who i was um up to that point and i had made that decision that i was getting out and i was no longer that person turning away from that i think part of the what i'm hearing and correct me if i'm wrong is that sometimes yeah, it can definitely feel like a corporation or some bigger entity is like who you are and like your identity and how people identify you. So then you finally internalize that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It it it's easy to get caught up in it, right? It yeah. it like this is all this is all to say that like I my relationship with Twitter is complicated partially because of that, and I've seen you know some things that I tweet. I some of the I don't I don't I'm not I like respect you so much being able to like utilize Twitter in such a great way and I'm just like I am just a, a dumpster fire of a person I'm like <laughs> I don't know what to tweet I'm like I don't know I did a cool gig sometimes I have feelings yeah. like I don't know <laughs> I don't, you know because like part of me part of me really does like want to be vulnerable and like open on Twitter especially like my God, when I was going through my divorce, I was like, I wanted yeah. so badly to be able to like talk about stuff that was going on. But like, yeah. mostly just because it was like Twitter was in a certain way, a lot of my community. But I, right. I one didn't want to want it to be seen as like seeking attention necessarily, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. And two, I didn't want to trauma dump. But more importantly, three, like I didn't because there's two people involved, I didn't want to like I, I didn't want it to be a one sided story because I don't think that's right. fair. Right. And like, yeah. I think my side is the correct side. He and, right. and 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 that's normal and that's fine. But I also didn't want there to be a situation where should people out in the wild see him and then view him in a way that was like, oh, he wronged our friend. Right. I don't want there to be like weird parasocial things that possibly happen with that. I also didn't I really didn't want to be seen as a victim and I really didn't want to be seen as like uh like some like hurt divorcee. You know what I mean? Like I was just yeah. like I really I I don't know. I so I intentionally tried to be as vague and as quiet as possible. People obviously were like figuring out what was going yeah. on. Um, but like there was a lot of healing through that where I was like, oh my God, there's so much that I want to be able to say. And especially if I'm able to help other women, cause I did have a couple women come to me like about a year later that were like, I think, I think I might be going through something similar based on what you've, the, the small nuggets that you've put out there. And I was like, do I, do I have a platform to be able to help people? But also like, that is my decision. So it was like, I don't know. It's such a complicated relationship. I have such a complicated relationship with it. And also I'm just like, sometimes I see people put like everything on the internet and I'm like, y'all, yeah. not everything needs to be on the <laughs> Like, oh, I don't always need to know what you're eating. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I definitely have an oversharing tendency, and I don't think that's necessarily part of my strategy. I think it's more of like a mental health thing for me, to be honest. I think a lot of it is that um, for me, I don't have, and maybe this will change in the future. I mean, um, you know, my mom, bl- bless her heart, uh, doing her best, but like my dad's transphobic. So I really want a lot of... Um, male attention so i i just desire that a lot and i'm going through a lot of stuff as far as like so i left i left the military i transitioned my wife as soon as i came out we ceased contact as soon as i said those magic words that i'm trans and didn't touch me for seven months and then after that we finalized like or she told me i wanted to force and i was like okay well and i had just spent seven months not touching anyone and I am a uh, person that really requires that sort of like love language, you know what I mean? So was incredibly difficult. I went through a lot of that and I made some very good friends, I think, who perhaps it was um, just kind of a thing that they did because they're good people. But um, I was supported by uh, a lot of different people, um, one of whom is like one of my best friends now, Chelsea. Dot. Uh, Cobalt Press. And, um, you know, it was 
I don't know if I could have like really done that whole thing without like just deciding and taking that leap of faith to rely on someone that I was just starting to work with. And thankfully it did because I was in an incredibly vulnerable position and I can yeah. see how that could have turned out really badly. Yeah. Do you, because of what I'm hearing through that statement is that there's a little bit of fear associated with it too. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. And being vulnerable with people. Yeah, because yeah. Um, I spent my entire life pretty much just kind of masking and not being myself because I was in the closet and yeah, revealing myself for the first time, like to people and then explaining my feelings. And especially now that I'm on hormones, like sometimes my feelings are I'm fucking extra. And as my girlfriend <laughs> would tell me, like, I'm extra spicy. So yeah. like, there's like the side that most people interact with, which is like the like business bitch type persona like that I generally present. And then there's like me spamming you at like 1am with messages as I sob into my pillow. And like, th those are the two different types of relationships that I have. <laughs> and yeah. like, I have these emotional issues, like once or twice a week, because I'm going through so much. And like, and it's and there's all the stress of the Kickstarter campaign that you know, you're, you're familiar with creators going through this. So it's like, yeah, I know I'm not myself right now. I know that this is like, it's represent, it's showing itself in different ways than I had perhaps anticipated. Mm. Um, and the additional stress that I had seen in like my old job, my old career, sort of, I know that it manifests in different ways for different people. Mm -hmm. And for me, I um, am just incredibly needy um, as a friend right now. And okay. thankfully I have really great friends. And then like, you know, um, I just get, I just have these times where I just decide, you know what, I'm not working today. Um, and I'm just going to cry into my pillow for, you know, half the day today. And then I'll be good tomorrow. And then that's yeah. it. Are you, are you viewing needy as a negative? It depends on, well, not from my perspective, because I, so here's the thing, like, I am incredibly needy, but I'm also incredibly loyal and there for someone, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm definitely like, one of those, like, I guess, loyal bitches that like, if, if we have like, built some sort of like, trauma bond, like I'm, I'm there for you, you know what I mean? And that's mm -hmm. just, maybe some of that is like my conditioning from like being in the military, but like, I would say it just depends. I really hesitate to be too much around people and uh, that I'm not necessarily really intimate with. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean that in like a platonic way. Um, yeah. And the first few times that I'm like vulnerable with people, I'm just like very apologetic for it, I think, which I think is also a trauma response. But I think at this point, every everything can be considered a trauma response, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because like, one of the challenges that my partner and I are dealing with right now, my my romantic partner, um, so we both left abusive relationships. Um, nothing physical, not that it matters, quite frankly, but nothing physical, definitely a lot of emotional gaslighting and manipulation and like mm -hmm. just stuff that was not good. Mm -hmm. Um and one of the th one of the challenges that we've we're still sort of dealing with, we have learned how to communicate much healthier. Is it a hundred percent? Like no, but like we're human. I'm human. He's human. Mm -hmm. We're gonna make mistakes. It's okay, and we give each other grace with that. But we also call each other out, which I think is really good. Being able to have a space where you can call somebody out and know that they're not gonna like manipulate you or fly off the handle or any of that, right? And be like, the way you're treating mm -hmm. me is not cool, and I'm not okay with that. Like, yeah, that's valid. Um, I am really bad at expressing what I need because mm -hmm. I'm hyper independent, right? And mm -hmm. so hyper independence is a trauma response, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's also the thing that I pride myself on. And it's one of the things that I actually really love about myself. I guess I just, I struggle with the idea that all trauma response, and I struggle right. with the idea that like this word needy, I think is miscategorized perhaps, right? Because like, Every human has needs. Everybody has needs. And if you don't get those needs met, you're either going to look elsewhere than where you're currently focusing your, your energy and your efforts. Or some people also like don't know what their needs are. Like I don't necessarily know what my needs are, quite frankly, because <laughs> right. I'm so hyper independent that I'm just like, I'll just take care of myself. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like that doesn't work in a romantic relationship most right. of the time, especially if you're with somebody who's like, no, but I like I need to know what it is. Like I need to know what your needs are. Right. <laughs> 
So like for me, being able to say like, hey, I I really need a little bit of attention right now. That feels so needy to me. That feels like the most needy, psychotic girlfriend thing to say to my partner that I just yeah. need a little bit of attention, right? Like that's yeah. that's kind of dark. <laughs> yeah. No, I t- I'm totally, I'm... I'm right there and I understand um, at least a little bit uh, based on my own experiences. And I think, you know, part of like me, like, and I still do it. I've been with my girlfriend for like nine months now. And Mm -hmm. um, I still like say once in a while, like after I have like some sort of emotional things, like I know I'm a lot and I use that. I'm like, I'm sorry that you're dealing with me. Yeah. Um, So, and she lovingly corrects me um she's very patient with me in that aspect but i mean like we me and me and her have like similar issues if i'm being honest like with abandonment yeah. and stuff but um yeah so it's yeah it's definitely uh, we got on here talking about twitter first right okay so no, i'm it back to twitter no no that's fine don't, don't apologize this is a wonderful <laughs> conversation um and i'm getting to know you a lot better which is great because i love working with you and yeah. knowing more about you is cool um <laughs> so um yeah, so Twitter. What I share, and honestly, and this is part of it, like, I didn't start looking at Twitter until, like, first quarter 2022, because I was like, mm-hmm. I need a platform that I can be comfortable with and that I can create content for and it not be, like, a high output thing because I'm also a professional GM and I need to be careful about my time. Right. So I'm a writer, and I was like, okay, well, I know copywriting, I know sales, I can do Twitter. And that's why it works for me. So... Mm-hmm. And I and I encourage people who are perhaps creatives looking at what they need to do or what they think they need to do with like whatever platform that they get. Don't start with them all. Just start with one and then yeah. one that you like and one that you can feel comfortable like sub, like creating for and like you kind of understand that platform. Mm-hmm. That's where you need to be. That's where you need to spend your time. Because like if it's going to take a bunch of energy out of you to be there. So I, that totally I kinda, makes sense. Yeah, I, I just spend like, for the most part, if I'm being good about my schedule and stuff, I will spend one or two days a week, maybe an hour or two. And I just draft up my Twitter stuff, my Twitter content before mm-hmm. and schedule it and stuff like that. And I pay for a scheduler for that peace of mind because I think it's invaluable what it gives it to me. Even if yeah. I'm paying like a monthly fee is like the scheduler provides me with peace of mind that I don't have to check my Twitter unless I want to be on Twitter. I don't have to like get up and draft that thing all the time. I can just find one day a week where I just want to draft stuff. If I want to browse Twitter later or check what's going on. But like for the most part, most of my Twitter content comes out through a scheduler. And if you see like some unhinged stuff, then that's like me being unhinged and deciding to post on Twitter. Um, I don't schedule my unhinged posts. I only schedule like my, okay, I got to be a serious creator and a professional and I got to make stuff that people want to read, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think also I have like a little bit of an accidental persona in games where like I, and, and like you've never actually met me in person, so you can only you know, sort of like vibe off of this. But yeah. you've told me so many times that I have big dick, big dick energy. <laughs> and, <you> that, <laughs> and that I'm, oh, there was another word that you used and I forgot now. It's probably complimentary. It was, it was a good, it was a good word. It was something like strong or something. I don't know, something like that. You but do I have a lot of presence, yeah. Presence, yeah. I've been told by a lot of people that they're like terrified of me when they first meet me. And I'm like, I, no, there's nothing scary about this, trust. <laughs> so I, um... I remember, uh, so I was initially like talking, so I'm a part of um, uh, Devin Nash's uh, business mastermind cohort Mm -hmm. thing that he runs, in which he like educates like content creators and other people like that uh, within new media, how Mm -hmm. to in new media for anyone listening is like YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, those sort of things, Um, new social platforms. Uh, where he educates a lot of people like how to build your platform, how to be a creative and like do it in a smart way and so on and so forth. He provides a lot of business inside mm-hmm. information because he runs this really successful agency and he was a content creator himself for a long time and it still is, um, but he does it like part time. So mm-hmm. um, for I was having this discussion and I was trying to figure out like what platform should I use? And the reason why I decided on Twitter was because it fit my style. And then I was 
talking with a lot of the people there and I was trying to figure out how do I formulate this pitch for this game? Mm. How do I do this thing? Because I was initially like shopping around at publishers before I decided to go with self-publishing. I don't know if we're still going to do that. We'll see. We'll find out. I guess yeah. maybe we'll find out by the time this episode airs. But when I was initially doing that and Devin Nash had like ripped uh, my asshole apart with his critique of my uh, presentation of the vineyard um, in the PowerPoint, which was super great and useful for me because, yeah. um, you know, he's a top industry pro so of course i want to take his advice but um i was looking for someone and i was like i need someone that knows how to run a kickstarter campaign so considering that this is like a super huge project now because i've let scope escape me and i've just hired too many people i really need to make sure that this is successful so i was just looking around on twitter and then i saw you i watched a couple of interviews i felt the energy and i was like yes i want to work with this person Oh, so amazing. I, so I decided based on watching a couple of your videos, and I will tell you which ones in particular and why I did that. Okay. Um, it was the videos where you were helping other people run their Kickstarter campaigns because I needed help with my Kickstarter campaign. I was like, how is this person going to interact with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. trying to remember which ones those are. There's... Man, I did a lot. I did a lot. You did a lot. I did a lot. It was. You did a lot. It was a different time. I don't know if I would. I. I, I don't think I want to go back to doing the amount that I was doing because it was kind of untenable. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, like the secret is, it's the same fucking talk over and over again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I noticed that. I, I watched a couple and I was like, okay, yeah, it's the same. It's, it's the, the same, same talk. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I really just needed someone like, and that's how I, and I understood what that was because like even mm-hmm. as a pro GM or an instructor for any of the stuff I did in the Marines, it's like if someone's just coming into this, then you really just need the basics. And then from yeah. there, once you see their demonstrated skill or you see a product where you can give individualized advice or critiques, then that matters. But if you're just talking to a broad audience, like, what are you going to do? Like, you have to talk about the basics. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, it was, man, those were wild videos. It's like, it's so (laughs) weird to watch yourself in that context. I was like, oh, I do so many weird, like I fidget and I just, oh God, I don't know. It's good. It's good feedback just to like watch your, it's good. I've, if anybody wants to do public speaking, there's an uncomfortableness where like, you have to watch yourself. You have to just go back and watch yourself and you pick up on a lot of things that you do. And there's a lot of like weird little idiosyncrasies that I was like, oh, I got to stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> what's one of I the, don't, but what's, what's one of the weird things that you do? Uh, a lot of it's cadence for me. And a lot oh, of it's okay. like, I'm going to say like, I'm just, I'm not going to, it's not, it's not going to, I'm not oh. going to exit out of my vernacular. I, <laughs> part of it is I'm a fucking millennial. And two, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm a native Californian. Like this is just mm-hmm. how I talk. And, and to like, I feel like there's a lack of authenticity if I were to just like exit out of my vocabulary. Um is a really hard one for me. Yeah. Uh, mostly just because sometimes my brain like doesn't always catch up with my mouth. And right. so I have to, I have, I've had to work on shutting, like slowing my brain down. Also how fast I speak, I've worked on so much because I used to talk really fast and like really jittery. And like, if you look at early early, early days of my talks, I'm talking a million miles a minute. And it's just because I get super nervous and being able to like, just getting comfortable with it and and doing it a lot has helped ease a lot of those anxieties and being like, whatever, I actually really like being on stage and doing this. It's fun. It's fun. Like being on a stage and having a couple hundred people like staring at you. I was like, oh, I'm like, (laughs) I'm like a professor. (laughs) Yeah, it is. It has got its own unique uh sort of flavor it's sort of like its own thrill once you mm-hmm. get used to not being terrified about it once you get over that hurdle um my daughter's coming into the room Do you want to hi the <gasps> is that an elsa dress it is yeah say say good good night tanya good night <laughs> i like your elsa dress she likes your dress <laughs> okay goodbye um i love it that's uh that's my daughter finley um <clears throat> But um, yeah, it, there's something about it. I got used to public speaking um, from being an instructor and like a recruiter. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's kind of unique and it's fun. It can be fun because like you learn skills like working the crowd and like, you know, interacting with the crowd is like a larger entity and stuff. And there's just a lot of unique stuff about it. That's really cool. Um, so let's talk. A, let's talk about Kickstarter. We, we talked a little yeah. bit about Kickstarter, but let's talk about how'd you get started on Kickstarter and uh, what'd you do there? And then um, just 
obviously broad strokes. And then <laughs> you did a lot. So we don't have time for everything on you. No, we me. don't. We don't. We really don't. Uh, similar to my job at Addicting Games, I just applied online. Um, I just applied for a games outreach lead position, which was you know, working with game creators for a crowdfunding site. I wasn't like super familiar with Kickstarter. <laughs> You'll see that I'm like not, I just sort of jump in. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I'll figure it out. Whatever. Uh, my yeah, I, too, yeah. I hell it. yeah. I love it. Um, yeah, I, I had like backed maybe like two or three projects, but I like didn't know how big Kickstarter was for, especially for tabletop games. I had no idea. <laughs> mm. um, I went through a couple rounds of interviews and <clears throat> I was hired because I was, you know, I interviewed well and they were like, oh, you know, she's not overqualified for for the position. But also I was one of the few people that, uh, oh God, this is so dark. Uh, I was one of the few candidates who actually talked to the other women in the room. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. All right. I yeah. That. So, yeah. 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 So there was, there was a, my boss at the time did a little bit of a trick with his interviews where he would, he made sure there was another woman in the room. Yeah. He was like, I want to make sure, got to make sure. And I was like, that's actually really smart. Yeah. Um, so I did, I did, I worked in the outreach team. So I looked for people who were running Kickstarter projects. I advised them on their projects. Uh, I did a lot of behind the scenes stuff at Kickstarter. And then mm -hmm. as the years went on, I started, doing a lot more sort of like public facing things and doing a lot of talks and doing a lot of panels and things like that. Uh, and then by the time that I had left, when I was the, the director of games, I was responsible for the whole category. So I was responsible for video games, tabletop games, LARPs, everything. I was responsible for everything. Um, it was very, it was a lot. And I left when we had our best year on record and I went out with a bang. And I think that's the time that's the best time to leave. Um, well, congratulations on leaving. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, congratulations on all your hard-earned success there. Um, Thanks. For, for you moving forward, um, mm -hmm. what do you think is one of the things that really separates the mindset that you need to go into with a Kickstarter and any other sort of business venture? If you're a, let me preface this, you're speaking to like, a some a, someone a creator or a creative that's thinking about running their kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. what separates this from anything else that they're going to do well the first thing is crowdfunding is very different than any other sort of funding that's out there right like an angel investor or even just getting like a business loan right like you have to pay the loan back um crowdfunding is set up to be a little bit more community-based in nature um i've heard <laughs> the terms crowdfunding and crowdsourcing be used interchangeably. Not the same thing, but sort of based on the same principles, for example. Crowdfunding is something that exists in order to fund creative projects through the use of community efforts, right? So I have a cool idea. Um, I want this to get made and I don't have the funding for it, but I don't want to go to a bank and I don't want to ask my parents and I don't want to ask my family and I don't ask my friends for a significant amount of money. But what if I were to get a whole bunch of people together that said, hey, we also believe in the thing that you're trying to make and we'll go with you on this journey from wherever you are in your development to seeing it made. You then have, unlike any other so source of funding material, right? So like a bank is going to be like, hey, you you need to pay us back. You need to pay us back. You need to pay us back. They don't really care what the thing is. Uh, an angel investor might just think it's cool, but it's kind of is what it is. Um, equity is different. All these other sort of like different sort of funding opportunities are different. Publishing is different. A publisher has a creative and financial investment in what you're doing. Crowdfunding is somebody is giving you money and you are promising to make the thing. That is a big responsibility. It is a very, very big responsibility for a creator to have, right? That relationship between you and your backers is significantly different than your relationship with a, with a publisher, with an angel investor, with uh, with any anything else that exists out there from a funding perspective, right? It's a very different relationship. That relationship can become pretty parasocial, uh, which can be a little bit challenging sometimes. You have a responsibility. Make the thing that you said you were going to make with the money that people have given you because it is a pledge, right? So people are pledging money 
to be able to have the thing made. That is a such a unique relationship to have. I think that that relationship, there's an integrity and, a, and an honesty that those backers deserve. So making sure that you're updating your backers on what's going on, making sure that you're being truthful and upfront and honest about what's, you know, where the project is and things like that, responding to comments, even when they, they suck, right? Obviously, abusive comments, it's a hard no. But if somebody's like, hey, I have a question about this design mechanic. And let's say it's a design mechanic that you love, but someone has a question about it. You got to answer, right? That's yeah. that's worth a discourse. That's worth having, right? The other thing is, if you are able to have a discourse and respond to somebody's comment that that is asking you legitimate questions about the campaign, and you're able to like satisfy them with an answer, you you no longer have a backer. You have a fan for life. You have a fan that if somebody, they are going to follow you to the ends of the earth with everything that you do as a creator, right? Like it's a totally different relationship than anything that exists out there. Um, you need to be able to show what you're doing, yeah. right? You want to have something, you want to have like for tabletop specifically, you want to have like an amazing image that showcases as much as you can. What is the book going to look like? What is the board game going to look like? What are the cards going to look like? What are the meeples going to look like? What are the minis going to look like? What are the, what is the dice bag going to look like? What is the dice going to look like? Right? Like yeah. what is all of this going to look like? And not just here's a render, here's a hand-drawn idea that I had. Cool. Great. You're not ready for crowdfunding then. You're just, you're not ready for what's about to happen, right? People want to see yeah. stuff almost in a finished state, pretty much in a finished state, or as finished as, as close can be possible. Video games is a whole different world. But I think uh, in terms of answering your questions from just what do you like, how does it differ from any other sort of business venture? It's the relationship that you have with your backers because one, you have so many, and two, they are not giving you thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars as individual contributors. They're likely giving you a much smaller amount. So one, they're going to be a hell of a lot louder. And two, uh, it's it's a relationship that should be respected um, on both ends. Like, right, both people need to come to the table with respect. But also it's a relationship that if you do, if you play your cards right and you run your campaign right, you have built a community on Kickstarter. And that is a very, very valuable thing to have. I think um, one of the things that scares me the most, well, I'm both excited and really scared uh, when we post the the Kickstarter is going to have uh, the preview adventure that mm -hmm. I wrote <laughs> up for people to read. So it's like when they respond to what we have, it's going to be like critiquing me <laughs> and yeah. uh, and my and my other friends that I've been working with on this thing. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't do all of it, obviously, for the preview adventures. So uh, it's like me, VJ, Kinesha. We'll have art from Yorsi. We'll have some assets from Venetus Maps. We'll have some music from Dungeon Dad. But like, yeah, it's it's a little terrifying um, in that respect. And I think in tried and true fashion, as uh, you and I both do, I guess, just leaping in before I look Um I somehow ended up on this uh, massive first time Kickstarter uh, for, for me. But, you know, I'm excited and we'll see where it goes. For many people, <clears throat> Kickstarter is kind of seen as a route to riches. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a conversation that you and I have had. Not that I ever had the preconceived notion that I would get rich doing this. But <laughs> for everybody else... Yeah. Um, do you want to briefly broad strokes talk about like what are the major concerns with like funding and things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first thing is that your the public funding goal that you have, uh, we all know that's not your real funding goal, right? Like you have an internal funding goal. And the reason that you put that public goal out is because that's the, the minimum amount that you need to make in order to just make the thing. Everything else is a stretch goal to reach that internal funding goal. We all know that. That's totally cool. That's totally fine. Um, to view Kickstarter as a get-rich-quick scheme is a is a wild perspective for a handful of reasons. It does, excuse me, it does happen where like projects come out of nowhere and they're like, wow, this thing's amazing. This is so cool. And like they they fund really quickly and there's like, you know, millions and millions of backers and or millions and millions of dollars and things like that. The thing to keep in mind though is even with a million dollar Kickstarter, you're not pocketing that money. You you might you might pocket some of it. You might be able to take some of it and be like, cool, I can like pay, you know, I might be able to like 
put this somewhere. That's cool. That's fine. But the thing is, people are backing for product. And so the product that you need to come out with, it means that like every time that more like you've reached your goal and then you're like, let's say that your goal is like 20,000 and then suddenly you're making 100,000. You need to think about how much product it is that you need to make because it means you need to have a conversation with your fulfillment company. You need to have a conversation with your ship with like shipping. How much is shipping going to cost for all of this? Right. How are you going to handle your shipping? Um, because that costs a lot of money. But usually with fulfillment companies, there's like a there's like a price break. And if you're if you're making more product, then you get a little bit less money. But every single dollar for the most part on your Kickstarter is going to get used. The money that you pocket from a Kickstarter is almost non-existent. Again, you might have a little bit, but even people that don't have stretch goals that make that have million dollar Kickstarters, that money gets used. You talk to any creator that's made a million dollars on Kickstarter, everybody says the same thing. Every single dollar gets used for shipping, product, manufacturing, right? That million dollars, that means that a million dollars worth of product that needs to get moved. Yeah, I was looking at um, just what it would be to uh, increase the the budget of the book itself to expand the book. And we kind of came to that conclusion that we're only making a few bucks every book that we sell. Yeah. Because, you know, most of it is going towards actually paying for the books or paying for the writers or uh, something like that. So, I mean, it's um, I know I'm going to have some at some point, some some hidden surprise or whatever. And I'll just, I guess, figure it out when we get there and Mm -hmm. um, be able to plan a little bit better on the next Kickstarter, hopefully. But yeah, um, yeah, this first one, I'm just going to gut it. We'll just (laughs) fucking do it. Just fucking we'll just fucking do it. Um, What's uh, what's the common trends that you see for um Kickstarters that don't make it besides those that just don't do any planning. I mean, I think that's obvious. Like, yeah, if they show up, like, what are some key trends that you see with uh, campaigns that that don't make it? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd say the biggest is that uh, there's a lack of community building. That's the biggest one, right? It's, oh, I'll just put it up on Kickstarter and people will find it. Or, oh, I don't have a mailing list, but like, I know a lot of people. So like, I'm just not worried about it. Like, okay, that happens. That works. But if you don't, start that process of which is all just effectively like pre-marketing, it gets to be a lot harder, right? So especially for first-time creators on Kickstarter, it's roughly a 30-70 split. Mm -hmm. So that means about 70% of your pledges are going to come in through the community that you've built because only about 30% of your pledges are going to come in through Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. So I think people think those numbers will be flipped where like 70% of your pledges are going to come in through Kickstarter and 30% is the community that you build, but that's not the case. Those days are gone. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, it's just not like it used to be where Kickstarter mm-hmm. was like new and there was like a lot of buzz. Now there are so many Kickstarters out there as well that you have a lot more competition, right? I mean, there's at any given point, there's between seven to eight on Kickstarter. And yeah, it's just harder to get noticed, especially with, I think, just this past two months. Like I've seen like 10, 15, like pretty sizable tabletop projects mm-hmm. on on Kickstarter. And yeah. I'm just like, wow, I don't know how everyone has space here but apparently we still do like people still have that space to to build in that way well it's not uncommon to have like a number of huge hits huge tabletop projects on kickstarter at any given time that's pretty common i would say like i've i understand why people say like oh i don't want to launch when like simon is launching or i don't want to launch when like you know this big creator is launching no no you do you do for the most part you know everything i say is always with a caveat of like for the most part Mm -hmm. um Generally, if you're a smaller creator and you're launching around the launch of a huge campaign, there's a trickle down effect, right? Because (laughs) those big campaigns are still bringing in new backers. And so those new backers, what they tend to do is they tend to go, oh, cool. There's this is cool. What else is on this site? So they search around for things that are maybe like similar. And if they've backed a tabletop project, they're going to look at other tabletop projects, right? So there's a ripple effect that happens when big creators launch projects. And so it's it's pretty common for young for um not I'm sorry, not younger, smaller creators to uh see what those are and then launch around the same time frame. Um for for you uh moving forward and like mm-hmm. doing some some new stuff in twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four. Yeah. Um what are you looking forward to doing in the future? Um wow, that's a good question. Um that you're allowed to talk about. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm allowed to talk about I think everything. Um, I well, Funkress has our record coming out. I don't know when. It'll probably be at the end of this year, if not the beginning of next year. Mm-hmm. Um, I I'm going back in the studio on Thursday because I'm I just recorded with a 
ska band, which is really cool. Uh, it's a bunch of the far, the former member, members of this sort of underground famous ska band in the 90s called Mesoscopheles. They're a satanic ska band from New York City. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. And they're still playing. Like, they're still, they just, like, announced a new tour. Like, it's really cool. Um, I'm recording on my friend Sky's project, which will be really cool. He writes some really beautiful music. I'm excited to do that. I don't really know what's going to happen with that. That's kind of on Sky. Um, I'm excited to keep playing. I have some cool gigs coming up. Um, I don't really know. Like, music is so challenging because, like, there's, there's, it's always each week is so different so i don't i don't really know i don't really know what's ahead of me i'm i'm excited to just try to get better each day as a musician um for game stuff i mean i would love to do more consulting i would love to do more freelance work for people if they have kickstarter projects that they're running i'd love to be your campaign manager i'd love to have a conversation i'd love to consult to see how i can help um i'm super easy to get a hold of um how can I, I get a hold of you? So my DMs on Twitter are open. My Twitter is at A-N-Y-A-Y-N-A. Um, or you can just email me, anya.combs at gmail.com. It's fine. My Instagram is uh, <laughs> at Anya Combs Her Hair. That's open to you. I've had people hit me up there. Um, <laughs> well, I'm sort of in a place where like I've been giving out a lot of free advice. And so I'm starting to wonder like if I should just start charging for it. But I... Yeah. I need to I need to work on that a little bit and figure out what that is. Um, yeah, I um I was in that situation actually as a professional GM for a little while. And then mm-hmm. I was getting so stressed out because so many people were like coming to me with like, hey, can you help me with the thing? And I was like, yeah, let me take this one on one time with you and like help you despite me having yeah. all this other stuff going on. And it just was untenable after a certain point. That's why I built my platform on Twitter and why I started the blog and why I started this podcast. <laughs> Mm. is actually because i was not able to help all those people that i wanted to help on like the yeah. start playing games community in their discord and it really came for me like when i went full time and then i started to talk to more people more people trusted my advice i was running free workshops constantly because i just wanted to help more people um mm. not to say that it was like i'm this messiah or something or like i'm yeah, just yeah, yeah. A magnanimous person i get enjoyment mm. out of helping people so it's selfish in a way like i enjoy it because i feel good when they come back to me and they're like hey i'm making this much a week now thanks to you and i'm like that's great that feels good you know yeah, so yeah that's what that's why i do it i mean like i like to help people but i also feel good when people tell me that i help them you know so yeah totally 100 um, percent. you should probably build your linkedin to uh talk about crowdfunding and uh in, in my opinion when you can legally i don't know if you have to leave uh your current company or like transition out or like if you can do that um maybe you'll do that a lot of people yeah. I think, sleep on LinkedIn. Actually, that's the number one platform uh, that's recommended by uh, Devin uh, Nash mm. uh, to build those professional content. A lot of people sleep on LinkedIn. I don't yeah. use it that much. But um, yeah, LinkedIn is a very big one for trying to get consulting work. I also just need to like build a website. I need to just sit down and like do the, yeah. the basic stuff. So yeah. yeah, I don't know. I'm doing a bunch of panels at conventions all over the world yeah (laughs) of course yeah yeah (laughs) as you do i will say um i mean working with anya thus far has been really wonderful um we'll we'll see what happens by may i don't know (laughs) i'm just kidding i mean if we don't hit those numbers if you're terrible to work with anya i tell you what i'm just not going to publish this episode of dollars totally fair (laughs) i'm i i think that is that is fair and i'll pay you for your time how's that (laughs) uh that's a uh, let's not discuss about holding you to that let's let's not imagine a future like that that's not the timeline oh i want to exist in no that would break my heart <laughs> might as well um but no uh yeah you've been really i would say um are you okay with me talking about like what you're really good at um anya's really oh, good no. <laughs> <laughs> um in my experience working with anya anya's really good at uh communicating very plainly uh despite having a very depth of knowledge within a given field which is uh very difficult to do because in in a lot of like the professions that i sort of get into or my experience as a business person the curse of knowledge is very heavy being able to translate that into actionable steps is so difficult for most 
people to be able to do. So it's definitely a thing that you can only do if you're both a master at communication and a master of the thing. Because if Mm. you can't break down something very simply, then you have not mastered the thing or you have not mastered the communication to be able to do that. Mm. So those are obviously very good. Uh, Anya is very good at um, crowdfunding type stuff, Um, has the resume to back that but also is a really good communicator. So I would say those are. Thanks. I love to hear that. That makes me happy. So you should probably hire Anya, whoever's listening that (laughs) might consider it. Hire me. (laughs) Uh, I'm also excited to just hang out with my dog a lot. Oh yeah. That's, that's important work to do. Yeah. She needs it. She's such a sweet baby. Yeah. I've, um, what are you, what are you doing now to sort of unwind? Because you're, you're busy. You're a really busy person like me. So what are you doing lately to unwind? Do you have a secret? Oh, okay. (laughs) I, uh, I, I'm really bad at managing stress. I'm really bad at managing stress. And I will, I will admit that it's something my partner has sort of called out in me. He was like, you're, you're, you got to get it together, I, which I appreciate having a partner who's able to say that to me. Um, I'm, yeah, I don't know. I'm really bad at it. I used to like, I used to engage in some really unhealthy habits to manage stress. And like, I don't do that anymore. I mean, I like, I play a lot of Stardew Valley. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, no, that's great. I watch, yeah, I watch a lot of reality TV. Nice. Um, I mean, I find oddly enough that like just playing my scales and like part of my warm up routine is just like very much a calming thing. I've had, um, I've had a really complicated relationship with like exercise, and I'm getting over bronchitis right now. Yeah. Which is just like ever. I was like, oh man, because I like I'd gotten kind of sick a couple weeks ago, and then it just developed. Um, and I was starting to go back to the gym. Um, but also with COVID, I don't know. I get really, I feel weird about going to the gym with COVID. I just like, it kind of freaks me out. Although at this point, it's like, I'll wear a mask. I, I can't do any cardio with a mask on. I just, my, I'm too asthmatic for that, quite frankly. It's too difficult. So I could do like weights and stuff like that. But I've like, I'm trying to find a relationship with exercise that is not obsessive. So yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's something that I'm going to try to work on once I have full capacity of my lungs back. Yeah. I found um one thing that I was really interested in uh, in order to sort of keep my interest with working out was finding like an activity or something that I was very interested in and like sort of spoke to me or was um, without making it a thing that would be like too addictive. But I mm-hmm. like skill learning and I like and that's kind of why I like uh, so I did martial arts for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And then part of that, I when I decided, hey, I can't be rolling around with people and that are breathing in my face all the time right now because of, you know, things, um, <laughs> you know, the panini. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, kind of transitioned to doing a lot of weightlifting. And mm-hmm. um, there's something about that that feels like it's like skill building, but it's like building like tiny little plates, like as you add like 2.5 pounds. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like that. So it, it it feels like there's like actual progress being done or um, like you have this relationship with I have this relationship with weightlifting now that's like less um, problematic for me because like when I was a cardio person and I was doing mostly mm-hmm. endurance style stuff, it was always like the next hill, the next thing, the next whatever. Yeah. Or like when I'm doing Olympic style lifts, it's like I do my three sets of squats and then that's it. Um and then I move on to the next exercise. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like not, it's not like I don't have like this moving goalpost yeah. for, for me. And it's very easy. It's much easier to control like that sort of addictive personality of like just adding a little bit more weight is much easier to resist than running a little bit further because, you know, I, I have guilted myself into working out more or whatever it might be. I get that. I'm a former ultra marathoner. So I, yeah. Yeah. I always was forget shit like that about you. And then you just drop it casually and you're just like, <laughs> Okay. You know, um, my claim to fame for my cardio was um, I did the California, uh, the Pendleton mud run on like a large. Yeah, Yeah, I did that. Have you ever done that? Were you there? No, I know what you're talking about, though. That one's intense. Yeah. Yeah. So I I did that. Um, I like I did it kind of on a lark. I had drank like a half bottle of Jack the night before I was a Marine. So um, and then I did it and then I like came in third and I was like, okay, well, I probably like, I, I might have a problem. <laughs> like there's either a problem. Oh my with, gosh. Like, yeah. So anyway, um, that was back in the day when I was like a corporal. So I was like in super good shape. I had no reason to do anything else with my life. I was like 23 at the time. but um, Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. I'm, you know, I was wild in the Marine Corps on you. Okay. Like. <laughs> I believe it. This is what I'm learning. <laughs> I was kind of wild. I mean, I was, you know, 
All right. Anyway, we don't have to talk about that. But <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, with that being said, um, did you have anything else that you wanted to mention? We're going to put your links, uh, your Twitter, your LinkedIn, funkrust.com uh, to check out Anya's band. Uh, listen to some of these tracks. It's actually on the website. You can just go there, go to the uh, mm -hmm. music tab, and then you click the play button. Um, yeah. And you can enjoy some of it. Um, I guess this is a good excuse for me to be a little bit better about promoting the shit I do on Twitter. Because I don't yeah. just play in Funkrest. I play in a bunch of bands. So it's, it's, I mean, the funk rust is my, my love, my one true love. I actually had a dream last night that I had to leave funk rust, mm -hmm. um, cause I like moved or something and I woke oh. up and I was like, so I was devastated mm -hmm. and then I was like, oh my gosh, it's not true. Um, I, I love that band. I will always love that band. Even, even when that band no longer ceases to exist, I will still love that band. Um, but I play, I do a lot. So I play in another band called the hungry merch band. I sometimes play in a group called off the bar brass. Um, I freelance, I do, I, I play in a wedding band sometimes called Crossing Midnight. Um, I just played a wild private gig this past weekend. Um, I do pickup gigs here and there. I played St. Vitus with Crazy in the Brains recently. Um, yeah, I play in Barbicide. Yeah, I do, I do a lot. All right. Well, that's a good place for us to stop it. Hi, thanks for listening. If you want to support me, you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash isfriday, or you can find some of the work that I'm doing at vineyardrpg.com if you want to pre-order the book that we made.